Thank you for the opportunity to share some of my research on microbat roosting. Uh, this is my first talk uh, I'm attempting to do online, so hopefully everything will run smoothly. Um, I'm just going to try and um, share my screen. I hope that will work. Does that look okay? Yeah? Okay. So, yeah, so my talk will be a summary of the research I undertook as part of my PhD that I completed last year. Uh, the overarching theme of the PhD was um, factors that influence the roost selection by microbats, so tree hollow roosting microbats. And originally I intended to talk about both the natural roost selection studies and the artificial roost studies um, that form part of the PhD. Uh, but I was just uh, unable to fit both aspects into the presentation due to time constraints. So I will just focus on the artificial roost studies. Uh, which I think are more relevant in an urban context, uh, given that nest boxes and bat boxes are a popular tool to support all the pen wildlife uh, in this landscape. Okay, but so first, before we start talking about the research, I will just uh, provide a bit of an introduction of what microbats are, just in case some of you may not be that familiar with these animals. Microbats are quite cryptic and often people talk about bats, uh, when people talk about bats, they may think of flying foxes rather than microbats. Um, there are quite a few species of microbats though in Australia and they make up almost a quarter of all Australian mammals. Essentially all of the Australian microbats feed on insects and some of the bat species are very small and weigh only a few grams. For example, uh, the little forest bat that you can see on the picture here. Uh, which occurs in Sydney, uh, which only weighs about four grams. In Sydney, we've got about 19 species of microbats that have been recorded and many more species occur across Australia. So there's more than 60 microbat species. Uh, microbats are active at night and unlike flying foxes, they hunt by making high frequency calls that humans can't hear to locate their prey. Uh, microbats can be broadly divided into two groups, one that roosts in tree hollows and the other that uh, uses caves. And my research focused on the species that roost uh, in tree hollows. There are many threats uh, to microbats. Uh, a number of threats exist um, uh, that include the loss of bushland and the associated loss of polar bearing trees due to activities such as land clearing, timber harvesting, or in an urban landscape, removal of trees that are perceived to present a risk to human life or property, and they often contain horrors because they are generally old trees. Other threats include predation for, from both native and exotic species. Artificial night lighting can be an issue as well, um, and other animals uh, that compete for the tree hollow resource that may outcompete bats from using hollows, such as the rainbow lorikeet the exotic Indian mine or the European honeybee. Pollution of waterways from urban or agricultural runoff may also be impacting bats as they require access to uh, drinking water. Okay, so now moving on to the research that made up the PhD project. Uh, the thesis was made up of seven research chapters. Uh, five of these chapters focused on artificial hollows and two on the selection of natural uh, maternity roosts. Tree, uh, tree rules, sorry. And um, all those uh, chapters have been uh, published in peer reviewed publications. So if anybody wants to have um, a paper that, um, on a topic that you're particularly interested, I'm certainly happy to um, share that with you. Okay, so four of the artificial hollow chapters focused on bat boxes and one chapter on creating hollows into trees using a chainsaw. Uh, so these chapters will be the focus of this talk. So why is re research on bat boxes of relevance? It's because of approximately 60 species of Australian microbats, about 40 uh, species rely on tree cavities for roosting. These species are impacted by lots of trees containing hollows and I've noticed that uh, once a tree, ho tree hollow is lost, um, it will take many decades to re-establish um, hollow bearing trees and it may even take more than 100 years 
for more substantial hollows um, to form. There are only a few management options to mitigate uh, the loss of hollow bearing trees um, for microbats. And the most commonly used tool to provide an additional roost resource in landscapes deprived of tree hollows is the use of bat boxes, including here at Parramatta Council. Despite the common use of bat boxes to offset the loss of hollow bearing trees, knowledge on the effectiveness of boxes is very limited. And so there's a need uh, for further research in this area. Okay, so now moving on to the first research chapter on bat boxes. Uh, this chapter was a global uh, literature review on research papers that focused on bat boxes. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to be very brief for this chapter and just outline the main findings. Okay, so overall I reviewed 110 publications and the review showed that Europe has a has the longest standing history of research on bat boxes, with some research also published from North America and Australia in recent years. Across the publications, timber was the most commonly used construction material, with wood cement, which is a material made up of sawdust and cement, also frequently used, uh, but only in Europe. Overall, the literature review identified 68 species of bats that have been recorded uh, that use boxes globally. And this may seem like a high number. Uh, however, only 18 species were identified use boxes commonly and only 29 species were reported to have formed maternity roosts in boxes. So some of the key conclusions of the literature review were that bat boxes have been used extensively for research and conservation purposes across Europe, but details on their use in other regions is largely lacking. Uh, the re review also identified the lack of records for maternity roosting in boxes, which is a concern given the importance of such roosts to maintain viable populations. Another concern was that only few species uh, commonly use boxes. For example, in Australia, only the gold swaddled bat is commonly reported to use boxes. And there is uh, no clear evidence that the use of bat boxes in Australia are effective as a conservation tool. The review also raised concern that there may be a risk that boxes have the potential to alter local bat communities where only one or a few species benefit from the boxes. Okay, so the literature review also identified areas of further research that included setting up experiments to test existing boxes designs across regions and to test new box designs and to investigate whether bad boxes have the potential to all the bad communities. Other areas of research um, identified as part of the review included investigating the effectiveness of using bad boxes as an offset tool for lost solar bearing trees at development sites. Uh, to investigate the suitability of wood cement boxes in Australia as box construction material um, with the aim to increase box longevity compared to the commonly used plywood boxes. These plywood boxes um, commonly only used, uh, uh, only last about five to ten years. Um, there's only, uh, there's also uh, an, uh, concerns raised uh, in terms of box microclimates. Uh, the suitability of temperatures experienced in boxes may not be favorable to bats uh, because presumably uh, natural tree holes are much better insulated. And lastly, to test uh, another research area is to test alternative methods of artificial hollow creation, such as the mechanical creation of cavities into trees. And some of these areas of research have formed part of the subsequent studies I undertook as part of the project. Uh, which I will talk about now. Okay, so moving on to the next study, which investigated the effectiveness of using bat boxes to offset lost hollow bearing trees at an open cut coal mine. So it's essentially a case study of investigating whether or not bat boxes were effective. Uh, the reason for this study was 
that conditions of consent to carry out works that include the clearing of hollow bearing trees, frequently prescribe bed boxes and nest boxes to be installed to offset the loss, <clears throat> the loss of tree hollows. Large scale examples of this include RMS highway upgrades and, uh, and mine sites. Uh, despite this common approach, evidence about the effectiveness of using bed boxes is largely absent and this requires uh, investigation. So the study had two overarching aims. One was to investigate the effectiveness of the mines bed box program that aimed to offset the loss of tree hollows. And the other aim was to identify factors that may influence the use of bed boxes. So first, let's just have a quick look at the setup of the study. Uh, four different um, bed box designs were installed by the mine operator prior to, to the research study commencing. These boxes were installed in clusters across the mine's uh, biodiversity offset area. Um, overall, I um, uh, monitored 109 uh, bed boxes every month over two years. Uh, and because box use was very low in the first year of monitoring, um, we made some changes to the setup of the boxes in the second year to test two hypotheses that may explain the low uh, box use. The first test investigated whether the soil exposure of boxes was inadequate for bats, and the second test investigated whether the available box designs were unattractive to bats. Uh, to investigate the first hypothesis, we re relocated a subset of the existing boxes to afternoon sun exposed locations. Uh, and to investigate the second hypothesis, we introduced a new bed box design. Uh, and this design was based on a North American design, which had a black exterior, was larger than the other box designs that were already installed and comprised of four narrow chambers. Um, this newly introduced design is shown here in the picture on the slide. Um, the statistical analysis um, that we used tested a number of factors that may influence box use by bats, and these included the box type, the level of mid-story vegetation surrounding the box clusters, uh, life and dead basal area of trees, hollow bearing tree density, the aspect of boxes, the, head, the height of boxes installed above ground, the time since box installation, uh, we also looked at seasonal changes in box use and whether the relocated boxes to a sun-exposed location and the newly introduced box design uh, influence box uptake. So looking at the results in year one, um, the results show that box use was very low with only 5% of boxes being occupied by bats um, during the monitoring sessions. The results also showed that only three of the 13 locally occurring microbats used the boxes. The statistical anal analysis using occupancy modeling could not find any strong association among the modeled covariates, uh, which might be partly due to the low uh, bat, uh, bat box use. So data was very, very scarce to do the analysis. In year two, uh, the anal analysis for the box monitoring results showed that the relocation of boxes to increase soil exposure did not result in an increase used by bats, but the introduction of the new uh, box design resulted in an 11 times greater use by the lesser long eared bat. So that was quite a, a significant uh, finding. So this graph here now just shows the bat box used by the lesser long eared bat. Um, it shows the significantly greater use of the new design compared to the original boxes installed by the mine operator. Some of the conclusions that could be made from this study included that the type of box design can greatly influence box uptake. Uh, but more importantly, importantly, this study showed that the mine's tree hollow offset program was um, largely ineffective for bats as only a few of the local bat species were using the boxes and the boxes were only used infrequently um, by these three species. And there was also a lack of evidence that boxes were used for, for the rearing of young. So overall, the study raised concerns about the frequent use of bat boxes used to offset taller bearing trees. Um, the study also highlighted that our current lack of knowledge on species-specific box designs limits the effectiveness of using bat boxes. 
and there is a need to conduct further research on bedbox designs and a need to rigorously protect hollow bearing trees uh, wherever possible. Okay, so moving on to the next uh, study, which tested multi-chambered bed box designs and specifically looked at the influence of box use based on um, construction material, exterior collar, and box holes. Box holes being either tree or core. So this slide shows uh, the box types used for this study. All box types comprised of uh, narrow chambers. Uh, one box type was constructed using plywood and the other box type was made from wood cement, uh, which is, is essentially a mixture of sawdust and cement, as I, I think mentioned previously. Um, and so, yeah, wood cement is a commonly used material in Europe, but has not been tested in Australia before this study. Uh, and boxes were paint, painted either black or white with the intent to influence the thermal profile of the boxes. Uh, and the yeah, boxes were either installed on trees or on poles. So a bit more detail on the box designs. The boxes uh, had the boxes comprised of narrow multiple chambers that resembled fissure type cavities uh, rather than sort of large um, voluminous type hollows. The width of the chambers were 15 millimeters and each of the chambers were open at the bottom for bats to access the box. And all of the boxes were installed 1.5 meters above ground. So, so low. The reason for this study uh, were that boxes, do, uh, boxes used in Australia are largely voluminous type boxes and that these boxes are only commonly used by one species, the bull swatted bat. So there is a need to test different box designs and design elements in an attempt to attract uh, other species to use boxes. Also the longevity of plywood boxes has been criticized that these, as these boxes tend to only last five to 10 years, whereas boxes made from wood cement may last several decades based on overseas reports. So the specific aims of the study were to investigate whether exterior box color, box construction material and box holes could influence box occupancy. And the study uh, also investigated whether narrow chamber boxes resembling fissure type cavities are unattractive for the gold swatted bat and whether bat boxes made from wood cement are used under Australian conditions. So moving on to the results, over the 1.8 years of box monitoring, 245 bats were recorded to use the boxes. Uh, the boxes were frequently used by the lesser long-eared bat, including records of maternity roosting. Uh, this bat species has not been reported to use boxes commonly prior to this study, so it was a, was a good um, outcome, I guess, for, for this species. Uh, two other species were also recorded to use boxes. These were the gold swaddle bat and the southern forest bat, but both of these species were inf infrequently uh, found to use boxes. Uh, the graph on this slide just shows the three species recorded in each season and shows that the long-eared bat uh, dominated uh, the box use. The statistical analysis was only undertaken for the data on the lesser long-eared bat due to the long numbers recorded by the other two species. Uh, the modeling showed the preference by the lesser long eared bed for black boxes, larger plywood box, and boxes that were installed on poles. <clears throat> so the study showed that the fissure type cavities uh, met the roots requirement of the lesser long eared bed, and in contrast, the gold, uh, the gold swaddled bed, which, as I mentioned, is a species principally detected in voluminous type boxes and postulated to gain a competitive advantage where boxes are installed, was only infrequently recorded. The black wood cement box was the second most frequently used design, which indicates that this material can be, suit can be a suitable alternative uh, to that of plywood boxes. But given only one of the locally occurring microbat species used uh, the bed boxes at a high frequency, indicates that the tested box designs were not attractive for the majority of the local species. And again, this highlights that uh, there really is uh, further research required into bed box designs and identifying design elements um, that attract other species. 
All right. Um, now moving on to the next study. Uh, the study was investi uh, the study investigated the temperatures experienced in the boxes uh, that were used in the previous study, uh, which I just talked about. Um, the reason why I was interested in monitoring the temperatures of uh, the boxes was because room temperature can affect an animal's energy budget when they occur outside the animal's thermal neutral zone. Um, also, overseas studies have raised concern about the uh, suitability of temperatures experienced in bed boxes. Uh, for example, there are fears that boxes may become too hot during, summer, during the summer period and may even become lethal for bats. So knowledge on box temperature is considered particularly important during ambient temperature extremes. But box temperature is also important for energy conservation by bats, as bats are known to use passive rewarming when they enter torpor, as room temperature increases during the day. Uh, um, in addition, warm roots are, roosts are also important for dependent young and for lactating females to maintain optimal, optimal body temperatures and to produce milk. The aim of this study was to compare the different thermal regi regimes between the bed boxes and elements. So specifically, I investigated the influence of exterior color. So black versus white boxes, uh, construction material, plywood versus wood cement. And I was also interested in uh, whether the multiple chambers um, provide a difference um, between the chambers within the box um, yeah, if there is a thermal gradient within the box. So um, that could be relevant because then bats could choose um, suitable temperature if certain boxes or certain chambers get too warm. And it was under, also interested whether the, um, the air vents that were created within the boxes um, had an influence on temperature. And then uh, I also considered the recorded box temperature and the, uh, and the predicted ecophysiological implications for, for the bats. So looking at how the box temperature data was obtained, uh, the bed boxes were monitored during summer and winter, and small data loggers uh, are shown here in the picture uh, were used to record box temperature every hour. Uh, to compare box temperatures to ambient temperature, data from the on-site weather station uh, could be used. Uh, when looking at the suitability of the recorded box temperature in summer, I considered the thermal limits of bats. So the lower threshold of bats of the bats thermal neutral zone was predicted to be approximately 30 degrees and the upper thermal tolerance to be approximately 40 degrees. Okay, so now moving on to the results of the study. All of the tested boxes are in elements inference box temperature. So box color, box construction material, the sequence of box chambers, as well as the air vent also influenced, uh, all influenced uh, temperature. And the maximum temperature difference recorded between uh, the signs was up to nine degrees. Uh, the black plywood box provided the warmest box temperature for the four designs. Um, and the black wood cement box was significantly cooler to that to that of the black plywood box, but also warmer than the two white boxes. Whereas the temperature differences between the two white uh, box designs was minimal and followed closely uh, ambient temperature. So I'm not quite sure if you're able to see the details of this graph, but um, essentially that it just shows uh, the temperature variations across the designs over a 24 hour period for both summer and winter. And you might, able, might be able to make out that for both seasons, the black flowered box was warmest during the day, followed by the black wood cement box and the white box designs following closely ambient temperature. So this slide here shows the temperature differences recorded within the black plywood design. Uh, the graph shows that the chamber sequence within this box design resulted in a thermal gradient uh, with the upper parts of the front chamber being warmer than subsequent, <clears throat> subsequent chambers. 
but the graph also shows that the air when created uh, for the front chamber had a localized cooling effect. So you can see here uh, on the left picture, the front chamber air vent <clears throat> uh, that had an impact on cooling down the lower parts of, uh, of the front uh, chamber. The left picture on the slide, uh, um, sorry, the, the right uh, picture on the slide also show, shows a little vertical air vent um, that was meant to cool down the rear chamber, but as you can see <clears throat> on the graph that had very limited um, impact on cooling down the, the temperature within the box. This graph um, shows the percentage of days where the mean maximum day temperature reached the predicted lower thermal neutral zone threshold of fat, which was postulated to be 30 degrees. Um, and that's shown in the clear bars within the graph. And the black uh, bars um, show the percentage of days where the temperature reached over 35 degrees. You probably notice that there are a couple of red bars in the graph which show the percentage of days in which the maximum day temperature exceeded the postulated upper thermal tolerance of fats, which was uh, postulated to be 40 degrees. Um, above 40 degrees temperature only occurred infrequently and only within the front chamber of the second, of the, of the front and the second chamber of the thyroid box. So let's have a quick look at what the recorded temperature uh, may mean in terms of their suitability for microbats. For maternity roots, warm temperatures are considered important to facilitate the growth of young, as well as for mothers to stay normothermic, to produce milk and to attend to their young. So this suggests that at the study site, black painted boxes were more suitable for maternity roosting during, a, during the average summer ambient temperature. Uh, looking at the suitability of the box temperatures for roosts other than maternity roosts, uh, we know that microbats are well adapted to roost in conditions where temperatures fall below the thermal neutral zone by uh, the bats deploying torpor or using torpor. Uh, but we also know that bats select roosts, roosts that allow uh, them to passively rewarm from torpor. So given that the black boxes were consistently warmer to that of white boxes, including during winter, black boxes are likely to provide better energy benefits um, for bats. The prediction of bats preferring the black boxes was also supported by the findings of the study I just outlined before, where it could be documented that black boxes were strongly preferred over the white boxes by the lesser lonely bat. <coughs> But there's an important word of caution for the use of black boxes. Um, um, whilst these boxes tend to be preferred by bats and the temperature data suggests that on average, black boxes provide a more suitable thermal climate. On very hot days or in climates experience warmer temperatures to that of the study site, uh, the available availability of box designs that buffer from hot ambient temperatures uh, will be important. Okay, so now moving on to the last study of, the, of this presentation. Uh, this study investigated a different approach of providing artificial hollows. Uh, instead of bed boxes, I tested the use of mechanically created hollows that were carved directly into tree trunks using a chainsaw. Uh, the study not spe uh, did not specifically target microbats, but was set, set up as a preliminary investigation to test the suitability of using this, this technique for vertebral tolerating wildlife more broadly. Um, okay, so currently only one method of providing artificial hollows is, is commonly used, uh, which is the use of nest and bed, bed boxes. Uh, there, are, there is a need to test other methods of artificial hollows as nest boxes uh, can have some shortfalls. And some of those shortfalls include that boxes are com only commonly used by some species, which are often common species or pest species. 
The boxes provide unfavorable box uh, microclimates. The boxes are obvious in the landscape, which may increase the predation risk of animals and may also result in vandalism by humans. Uh, in addition, plywood boxes have a relatively short durability and may only last uh, five to 10 years. Nestbox programs can also be expensive because of the combined cost of box purchase and installation and the ongoing cost of box monitoring and maintenance. And there may also be an additional cost if an adaptive management response is required in situations where box uptake is poor. So the next few slides uh, just show some pictures that illustrate some of the potential shortfalls. This slide here shows examples of uh, short box durability. The picture of, on the left shows the bottom panel of the box being damaged by animals scratching or chewing on the plywood panel. And the picture on the right shows an S-box missing its lid, which can be a common occurrence depending on the type of lid, lid attachment used. Uh, this slide here uh, shows the common issue of entrance chewing. This box is designed for sugar gliders with an entrance of about three centimeters. Um, however, the brush tail possum has gained access and has made the box unsuitable for sugar gliders. Uh, this slide shows the issue of poor box attachments. Uh, boxes are commonly attached to trees without regard to the growth of the tree stem. Uh, but there are box attachments now available that do allow for tree girth growth, such as the system shown on the right of this slide, um, which uses loops within the wire attachment that allows the extension of the wire as the tree grows over time. Uh, this slide here just shows the potential issue with Indian miners, which is an exotic, spe exotic species. Uh, this bird not only uses boxes for breeding, but they also fill up neighboring boxes with materials, including feathers, bark, leaves, grass, and even plastic pieces to prevent other animals from using the whole resource. Um, these uh, pictures were taken uh, from, a, from, from Bankstown Council nest box program. Uh, but I should add here that uh, the issue would not only be an issue for boxes, but uh, most likely also for tree hollows. So given the use of boxes uh, can be some issues, there's a need to investigate additional techniques uh, to provide artificial hollows. <clears throat> so as, a, as I already mentioned, this study investigated the use of hollows carved into trees using a chainsaw. Uh, the study was only set up as a preliminary story, a study with a relatively small sample size. This technique uh, received surprisingly little attention in the scientific community. The method was briefly described in North American publications in the early 1980s. But since then, scientific publications on this technique are largely absent. Um, although I note that several research studies are now underway in Australia, which is a great outcome. The potential advantages of using this technique over the commonly used plywood boxes include a predicted greater longevity, a greater cost effectiveness mid to long term, a closer resemblance to natural hollows, including microclimates, and a potentially greater attractiveness for a larger number of hollow dependent species. So the aim of the study was to describe a method of mechanical hollow creation to investigate the effect of wound wood development around the hollow face plates by the host tree, um, as there were fears that the face plate may become dislodged over time. Um, I was also interested to investigate the stability of the hollow trees because they may, there was a risk that the tree may collapse because the, the cavity was carved into the tree trunk. And I also monitored uh, hollow use and I was interested what sort of animals may use those hollows. The study was conducted in the Caribbean State Forage, uh, Forest, which is near Nora. The state forest is managed as a native timber production forest, uh, which was largely depleted of natural hollows. The forest is a dry sclerophyll forest uh, and spotted gum was the dominant tree species in the upper stratum. 
So looking at the setup of the study, overall I created 16 hollows with the hollows being approximately four meters above ground. So this slide and the next few slides just provide a brief overview of the process of creating the hollow. This slide shows the face plates being cut off with the face plate being approximately four centimeters, four centimeters thick at its thickest point. This slide shows the process of creating the actual cavity. Uh, a number of plunge cuts were made with the chainsaw to create the grid-like pattern. And then the individual uh, wood pieces were hammered out. Uh, the width of the cavities uh, were guided by the girth of the host tree at the location of the hollow. And I used uh, two different thicknesses uh, of, uh, for the residual wall um, to test for uh, tree stability. So half of the hollows were created with a residual wall width of 50% of the trunk's radius, and the other half of the hollows had a residual wall width of 30%. So once the cavity was created, the face plate was then reattached using galvanized screws in each of the corners on the face plate. I also um, created an entrance hollow uh, by drilling it into the face plate and the location of and the size of the entrance ho hole varied uh, in an attempt to make the hollow attractive for a range of different species. Um, overall, six hollows targeted microbats, and the remaining 10 hollows targeted hollow breeding birds and arboreal marsupials. The difference between the bat and the bird marsupial hollows uh, was that the location of the entrance was the location of the entrance, with the entrance uh, being located towards the bottom of the face plate for the bat hollows, and near the top for the bird marsupial hollows, um, as you can see on this on the picture here. Uh, the bat holes compri comprised a 40 uh, millimeter entrance and half of the bird marsupial hollows had an entrance size of 40 millimeters and the other half uh, an entrance size of 75 uh, millimeters. So this slide just shows the three different hollow types once they were completed. The left picture is a bird marsupial hollow with a small entrance. The center picture is um, of a bird marsupial hollow with a large entrance, and the picture on the right is a bat hollow with an entrance being located near the bottom of the cavity to provide a roof space above the entrance. I should also mention that due to the concern that trees may fail uh, once the hollows were cut into trees, half of the hollow host trees were killed using glyphosate uh, to reduce the wind force on the tree canopies. So over the period of the study, I inspected the hollows nine times over a 15 months period. And I did an additional two inspections at 21 and 24 months uh, to document wound wood development and its potential impact on the hollows face plate, um, as well as to monitor tree stability. The physical inspection to check uh, for hollow use was done using a snake eye camera and a ladder to access the hollows. Uh, next to the physical monitoring, um, I also used uh, motion activated cameras. Uh, the cameras were set up to record 13 second long videos once they were triggered. Okay, okay so now looking at which species use the hollows. Overall, five vertebrate species were recorded to have used the hollows. There were the feather tail glider, the brown antichinus, the white throated tree creeper, the sugar glider, and the long eared bat. Uh, camera records also documented hollow inspection by the crimson rosella and the sacred kingfisher, uh, but no hollow use could be confirmed by these two species. Okay, so now I just thought I'd share some of the videos that were recorded to give you a bit of an idea of the type of records obtained. The quality of the um, videos are not very good, but I hope they will still be enjoyable. So uh, let's see if that works. Okay, 
So this first video is of a shoe glider. This glider is carrying small twigs in the, into the hollow uh, to build a nest using its prehensile tail. Okay, the next video shows long-eared bats inspecting the hollow. And given uh, the number of bats recorded in this video um, and the time of year, it may have been that this hollow was temporarily used uh, as a maternity roost, uh, but I was unable to confirm that. This video, video is of a white-throated tree creeper that is carrying nest material in its bill. Um, the white-throated tree creeper was one of the first species that used uh, the tree hollows. I think it only took one day after the hollow was created for them to inspect the hollows. And so the last video is one of my favorite animals, uh, which is the feather tail glider. Uh, as for the sugar glider video, this feather tail glider is also carrying in this material, its prehensile tail. So overall, the use of the hollows increased successively until it plateaued about seven months after the hollows were created. And prolonged hollow use was documented for the sugar glider and the white through the tree creeper. Competition for the hollows could be documented through camera footage. Sugar gliders were seen to evict feather tail glider and white through the tree creepers, which show that uh, the hollows did not provide sufficient protection for these smaller animals. Uh, next to hollow competition, camera footage also provided some interesting observations, including uh, predation by a diamond python uh, on a sugar glider. So I thought I might share that video with you too. Okay. Um, so this slide here looks at uh, just at uh, the tree stability. Over the two years of monitoring, none of the trees failed. Um, some of the experienced winds were quite high with the highest wind speed recorded being 91 kilometer per hour at the nearby weather station. Um, and wind speed um, of over 90 kilometers per hour uh, are known to often result in trees being uprooted according to the Beaufort wind scale. So this slide uh, just provides a description of the effect of wound wood on the face plate over time. Uh, the growth of the wound wood did not dislodge any of the face plates, but instead enclosed the face plates, uh, which likely results in improving uh, the longevity of the face plate. So there was a, a good, good outcome. So looking at what this preliminary study has shown, the study documented that this technique has the potential to become an additional tool in artificial hollow provision given hollow uptake was fast and the hollows were used over prolonged periods. Um, the hollows were also used uh, to rear young by sugar gliders and by throw the tree creepers. The study also highlighted that the hollow characteristics would need to be altered depending on the target species. For example, hollow inspection by the crimson rosella, but the absent use suggests that the cavity characteristics were not suitable for these species. Also, the entrance size uh, used in the study were, was not small enough to exclude the sugar glider, which led to the exclusion of smaller species. Um, looking at the longevity of the hollow face plates, uh, there was some concern at the start of the study that the face plates may experience cracking or fall off. Um, however, the wound wood developed by the trees occluded the face plates along the sides and sealed gaps. Um, so the face plate occlusion likely means that the hollow resembles natural hollows more closely and the longevity of the hollows uh, is extended. So because of the advantages of wound wood growth around the face plate, hollow host trees should be kept alive where possible, although this may not be feasible in some landscapes, particularly in landscapes uh, where there may be fears of, of injury to human human or, or property damage if um, a tree were to collapse. Okay, the longevity of the hollows and hollow trees can only be established through long-term research. Um, but this preliminary study indicated that in forested landscapes where 
surrounding trees provide some wind protection, creating hollows that had a residual wall width of 30% uh, of the trunk's radius uh, may be suitable. Um, the time it took to create the tree hollows is relevant for comparison to the cost of installing nest boxes. For this study, it took approximately, approximately one hour uh, for a hollow to be created. Uh, this suggests that the initial cost of creating tree hollows is likely similar to the cost of purchase, purchasing and installing nest boxes. Uh, because the longevity of created hollows is predicted to be greater to that of nest boxes, they may prove to be more econo economically um, more economical mid to long term. It's important to note that this study was only preliminary given the small sample size um, and the limited duration of the monitoring. Further research is required to advance this technique and to better understand whether this method can become an effective tool in providing artificial hollows. Okay, I think that might be that might be it. Okay, so uh, Grace, I think we start with some questions, if there yeah. are any. Yeah, thanks so much, Neil, for that um, very informative presentation. Um, so we'll answer some of those questions in a second. I can see that Kira has been keeping an eye on the comment um, box, but if you have any other questions that you still wanna ask, please quickly put them in the chat box now um, and we'll ask Neil for you. And while Niels is answering some of your questions, um, I'm about to put up that feedback poll. If you wouldn't mind filling that out for us, that would help us out a lot. Um, it helps us plan for future webinars. And just a reminder that your answers are anonymous. So Kira, um, did you want to start off with some of those questions? Yes, sure. So we've got quite a few, Niels, and there's a few more coming in as we speak. Uh, so the first one is, um, would hollow, uh, hollow use be impacted by the removal of vegetation, so such as shrubs and other trees surrounding a hollow bearing tree? Um, we had one person comment that it would help with keeping the boxes warm, having more sun on them, and opening up a flight path. Is this uh, correct, or do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, there's certainly some research that uh, suggests that um, if the vegetation sort of in front of the entrance of the that box that that could reduce uh, the use of of the boxes because that's gone you know directly lying to the box um, in terms of removing vegetation to create some more sun exposure um, it is a bit tricky and it, it will largely depend on the local climate so for example if there is an extreme heat event uh, in summer um, it may actually be beneficial that the sun, uh, the, the box receives some shade. But generally warmer boxes, as I sort of indicated in one of the chapters, are generally better. But once the boxes reach over 40 degrees, that's when it can certainly become a problem. Excellent, thank you. Uh, someone asked if you could please explain uh, poor poor a little bit more. Um, so you know how it's beneficial to the animal survival and, and when it typically occurs. So you say that again? Uh, if you could just explain torpor in a bit more torpor. detail, uh, so how it's beneficial to the animal's survival and, and, and when can it occur? Okay, so torpor is essentially another word for hibernation, but torpor can be quite short. So the bats use that to save energy because they're such um, little, little creatures and have a, quite a, a large surface area. So they're so to avoid having to spend a lot of energy to keep the body warm, they enter torpor, so they reduce their body, uh, reduce their body temperature. Um, so they save on energy and so they just become um, inactive essentially. And then when the conditions are right at night, if, if the temperatures have warm, are not too cold, they will um, wake up from torpor so they can go out and hunt um, or to, to feed. Um, and often, to assist the warming up from torpor, they use um, roosts that sort of help passively rewarm, so sun exposed uh, roosts, so or some species even use um, flaking bark, um, so it, they, they can um, use the sun energy sort of in, in, in the morning or even in the late afternoon to sort of warm from torpor and then they can become active for the, at least for the first part of the night and then sort of go back into torpor when they go back to their roosts. Excellent, cool. Um, 
Do you have any idea how the recent fires impacted on your study area at Currambeen? Um, no, I haven't been back. Um, one of my supervisors has uh, suggested that it might be worthwhile going back and having a look at um, how those trees um, are going. Um, but yeah, I've, I've got like uh, a very small family at the moment, so I probably won't be venturing down there, but I think um, the state forest uh, may be looking into that um, down the track. Yeah. Excellent, okay. Um, and I think you just answered it at the end, but how long it took to construct a hollow with a chainsaw? So you said it was about an hour, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. But I guess uh, I made it quite simple for myself. So it, it was only about four meters above ground. Access was uh, was pretty simple. So it certainly depends on where the, the holes are created, high up in the tree, what's the access like, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what proportion of the artificial hollows were used? Were there any that were left empty? Artificial hollows as uh, Sorry, in, like the, the cut in, the, the ones made with the chainsaws? Okay, yeah, they certainly were all used o over time, yeah. And um, predominantly by the sugar glider and, and the white throated tree creeper, yeah. Cool, excellent. And um, is there any concern that the, the wood wound, wounding process would completely shut over a hole at some uh, stage or does it stop at a certain point? No, I think that is that, that certainly um, that most likely will happen over time. Um, but because there's such great benefit of having that wound wood, I think it's worthwhile keeping a tree alive. Um, at some stage, I guess you could consider killing the tree if you're because you I guess this tree prevents a great habitat for a hollow. Like it's a hollow resource, so the tree probably doesn't have to be kept alive o over time. So once you are satisfied with the wound wood enclosure you may kill the tree so it won't um, close up the hollow yeah okay and is that more likely to occur in sort of like a five-year time period or more like a 20 30 year time period in terms of closing over fully i guess i don't know but um the wound would in, um was quite advanced over about over about two years um so it may only take yeah five years but it probably depends on the species, the species. and the local climate as well yeah okay so um, did more species of microbats use hollows created in trees compared to nest boxes, or did the study only record use by um, nitrophilus? Um, yeah, so the artificial, or the, the created tree hollows, um, there were not that many records of bats using um, those hollows. Um, so yeah, I guess I can't claim that they were superior to the bat boxes. Um, particularly to the bat box that uh, had multiple chambers and narrow narrow mm -hmm. chambers. Um, but yeah, the study was just preliminary. It was mainly just to look at a technique of creating these hollows. Um, but yeah, there certainly would be would be a need of more research on maybe designing a created hollow for, for bats uh, yeah, specifically. Excellent. I think we only have a few more. But um, if you wanted to install a bat box in your backyard, what is the best direction for the front to face and what is the lowest height that the entrance can be above ground level? Okay. Well, my boxes at the, the mine site, so we're only 1.5 meters above ground. So, but yeah, there's no research that indicates that boxes high up in trees are, you know, preferred by bats, but it might be, it just hasn't been you know, proven or documented yet. Um, in terms of aspect, it may it may pay um, to put two boxes up on the same tree, one facing sort of an afternoon sun um, aspect and the other one maybe a morning sun aspect, just to give that um, option for bats to select cooler or warm roof, uh, roofs depending on, you know, the ambient temperature of the seasons. Okay, and is it something, can you atta attach it to a wall or is it preferred that it's a tree and or a, a post? I think there's certainly, like in North America, they often put it up onto like barns, like sheds. Uh, or even I think in, in the UK, they do it do that often. So that certainly could, could work here. Yeah. Excellent, cool. Um, and then can you attract bats to feed in a backyard without building a bat box? Um, I think because like they, they use in or oh, they eat insects. So if there is habitat nearby, like a, a reserve that has tree hollows or tree fissures, 
um, I guess then they will likely come into your backyard if there's not too much light. Um, but in terms of attracting them, I guess they will be attracted if there's maybe lots of insects. But okay. um, yeah, I think it probably will be difficult. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that's it for the questions. Thanks heaps for your time today. I'll uh, pass back over to Grace just in case she's got anything else to say. Thanks for that, Kira and Niels. So Niels, we have a few um, positive feedback comments coming through. Thanks, uh, we're really interesting research. Um, we'd love to hear uh, more about it. Um, and someone commenting, is this going to be on YouTube? Yes, it will be on our YouTube once we figure out how to get it onto YouTube. We're having a little bit of technical issues at the moment, trying to get these large webinars um, uploaded, but we will figure it out and we will get it out to everybody. So a big thank you again to Niels for an amazing presentation and for answering some of our questions this afternoon. Um, City of Parramatta Council, very lucky to have Niels um, now part of this team. Um, so there'll be lots of good stuff happening in our bushland reserve. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. So this presentation has been recorded. And as I said, we will figure out um, a way to get it out to you. We would prefer to get it out over the next week or so, but just be patient while we try to figure out um, those few technical issues that we're having. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Before you go, I wanted to plug Parramatta's Bush Care Volunteer Program, since I am from the Bush Care team who have been organizing these types of online webinars and videos during COVID. Our Bush Care Program has only recently, as of yesterday, opened to new volunteers since the COVID Bush Care shut down um, in March. Previous to this, we, were, we had a couple of months where we were open to existing volunteers only because we had to limit our workdays to 10 people, but we've been now given the go ahead to open up to 20 people um, a workday, which is very exciting. So if you've been thinking about volunteering and you live in or around the Parramatta area, now is the time. So what we'll do is once we get um, this video uploaded, we'll send out an email to everybody and we'll also include in that a link to Parramatta Bush Care. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I was also just sent a message um, when you were reading out those questions, Kira, from the Sydney Olympic Park Authority. They recently launched, launched an ebook on 20 years of ecological restoration in, um, at Sydney Olympic Park. And um, there's two chapters in that um, about the nest, their nest and roost program. And they wanted to share that with the group. So um, thank you so much. That would be wonderful if you could send that um, link to us at our Bush Care email address, which I've um, responded to you with. That would be great. And then we'll share it with everybody um, in that email that we send out. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Special thanks to Niels for his time and for sharing all his knowledge. That was really, really wonderful. So have a good evening, everyone, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you.